have in common besides that somebody picked them and decided that we should find our joy in them. All of them are speaking about a time or a place where things are not as one would hope that they would be. Isaiah is preaching and speaking to people as we have been talking about for the last few weeks who are in exile. Their land has been overtaken by another empire. Many of them have been taken out of the cities where they actually had their temple and their roots and their identity and sent far away. They don't know if their children can be raised in their own faith. They don't know if their faith will go on. And they wonder where is God in all of this when everything that matters to them is taken from them. And Isaiah is the voice of hope, pointing to God and saying that God will walk among us again. And everything that is bad will be turned to good and you will be blessed and you will be taken care of. The psalmist makes that same promise that God walks with us and God cares for us and that God loves the most vulnerable among us and that indeed it is in the caring for those who are most vulnerable that God shows how much God loves each and all of us. And finally, in Matthew, John, who once baptized Jesus and welcomed him into his ministry, is now in prison. Herod, that same bad guy who questioned the wise men and wanted to slay a child because the child might overturn the world, is threatened by anybody who speaks of hope and change and has put John in prison. And John is worried and disturbed in prison when he hears about the things that Jesus is doing. And he sends people to ask Jesus, are you the guy that we've been waiting for? This is the same man who baptized Jesus not so long ago. And now, John's in prison and he's wondering, is this the Messiah? Should I be in prison or shouldn't Herod be out of a job right now? Isn't that why Jesus came to overturn kings and thrones? These are ancient words. Isaiah's words were old when Jesus and his followers read and listened to them and used them again. No prophet had come for hundreds of years. And the people in Jesus' time were waiting desperately for a Messiah, and they felt abandoned by their God. And then John shows up and he says, prepare a way. God is coming, and you won't know exactly when, but you're going to be surprised. But then wait a minute, the guy who says prepare a way ends up in jail. And even John is starting to wonder what's going on. What does it mean when the Messiah comes? Because everything I thought was going to happen hasn't happened. And isn't that what it's like for us in this Advent season? If God is so busy in our world and loves us so much, why are there children setting fires in the South? Why are there black bodies falling to bullets? Why are there terrorists who do not represent their faith claiming that they are the voice of God and they are not hurting people in our world? Why are people that we love stricken by disease? Why are their minds changed and their identities transformed in ways that we don't recognize so that those we love the most become strange to us? Where is the God that promises that the land will bloom and the water will flow and the fire will burn and we will experience joy? The words are old, but the words 
are still the words of hope, and they are spoken by people who knew what it meant to be pressed to the edge of survival and hope and transformation. These words are as real and necessary for us today as they were 2,000 years ago. When we think about joy, it seems as if it's not something that happens all the time. Doesn't it feel as if joy is a mountaintop experience? A, a moment that pierces through your regular everyday living and shines a light on it and changes the way you look at what's happening around you. How do we get from the places where we wonder why are these things happening in our world or being so busy that we're just not even paying attention to the moments when we're experiencing the piercing clarity of joy? Our hospitality team is having an experiment in Fellowship Hall today and I think it's actually a great example of joy. This is a lemon slice. And isn't the desert like a lemon? And the tough, difficult things that are happening in our world and our own lives, like the tartness. And here's this interesting candy cane piercing the lemon. And you're supposed to suck on it until you make a hole in it and taste some of the sweetness along with the sour and the tart. All right, well, I already tested this, and I didn't get a hole yet, but boy, I got some lemon and some sweetness, so it still seems to work even if there's not a straw thing happening. So we can learn a little bit about joy from our hospitality team, but who are some other people that we can learn about joy from? Children generally speaking, don't understand anything except joy. They're just wired for it. I was talking with another mom whose child also was a hospital patient, and she and I were comparing notes on the many ways that our daughters, who lived in hospitals and lived with altered bodies and different realities than most children have, still found ways to enjoy themselves sometimes in naughty ways. <laughs> Had my daughter Jessie grown up, I believe she would have probably been on a motorcycle getting speeding tickets, and here's how I know that. In a hallway at Children's Hospital Boston, attached to an IV pole full of toxic chemicals, she used to do kind of like this skateboarding, freewheeling thing, so she would put one foot on the IV pole, and she would push with the other, and she would go as fast as she could down the corridor. And we're sort of going behind her going, hey, slow me down! Well, she is built for joy, and if that's where she can have her joy, she's going to get it. So she would zip around the corner, and the kids would do these big whoops and these big parades, and she was going as fast as she can, and at least one time, um, she clipped her line as she went around the corner too fast. You know, everything's flying this way, and the line got cut and she had a hazmat spill in the middle of the hallway. <laughs> that did not stop her from enjoying every moment of what she was doing. Children are wired for joy, and if you thought that living in Children's Hospital Boston in any of those units was the most depressing place you could be, you are so wrong. Children are alive and filled with joy no matter where they go. But what about us grown-ups? What about us adults? We talked about caregivers a couple of weeks ago, and now I want to talk about a different kind of person. John is a prisoner. He's exiled from his life, and his hope is in short supply. I supported another woman in a New Hampshire women's prison who came from my own town. She was at my ordination service last week. You won't have known this about her when you saw her search team, but she was there. She made a very bad, dangerous mistake in her life. 
The causes for it are her causes to know, and she has worked very hard not to ever make that mistake again. But she went away to prison for two years. She is an educated woman, a nurse, and she's the mother of a three-year-old child. Being sent away from your child, knowing that you won't see her for a couple of years and that it was your own mistake and your own pain that he took you away from her is a difficult place to be. And there are many stories about the ministry that she conducted in that place of exile. But what I will tell you now is that for her, joy is everyday gratitude. It is being back in her own life after those two harrowing years. All the work that she did to be allowed to go and reunite with her family and all the work that her community did to support her in her exile. It is being reconnected to those relationships that are whole and holistic and helpful and healing to her that gives her the capacity to be the woman that she is now. And it is her heart turned towards God and reconnecting in those relationships that makes her a woman of joy. But every day the privilege of walking her child to class, putting on a uniform and going to work again and healing others, walking down the street to buy a cup of coffee or get behind the wheel of a car and drive someplace is a privilege that she lost. <clears throat> She breathes joy because she breathes gratitude for every moment. And her voice from there and her voice back in her life is the voice of the exile saying, pay attention. Love those around you. Love what is possible for you. And do the work of restoring what you can. God loves us where we are and meets us where we are. That God also loves and dreams of who we can become and all that we can do in our lives whether they are short or long we are wired for joy when we take the time to be grateful and remember all that is given to us this is a season when we sing alleluia and it means praise to God. It is the song of joy. So for the remainder of the season, when you sing Alleluia, remember you are singing joy. And finally, because you know I like to do this, let's feel what joy feels like. You don't have to leave your pew, but I would ask you to rise up and stand if you are able to do that. And I would ask you to stretch your hands as tall as they'll go. Oh, way up. And then, let's try shouting for joy. You guys were really quiet this morning, so you're going to get it now. Right, ready? We're going to try this. One, two, three.